the heart, cardiovascular system. Uh, pitter patter heart, tiptoeing through one moment, galloping the next. I'm going to talk about blood first. I'm going to talk about blood, and then we'll move to the heart. Okay. Uh, blood, it's, it's hard to think of a more symbolically charged uh, aspect of our physical humanity right, than the blood. Um, it's ancient, truly, like in a cosmic sense. The iron that makes our blood red its birthplace was here. The iron that's in our blood, those very atoms, at one point in time, uh, were created in a supernova. That's incredible to me. I don't know, that makes me feel pretty uh, odd. The ocean um, is not remarkably dissimilar from our own blood. We take it for granted, right? Because there's water, we live on a watery planet, and there's a bunch of salt water on it. And the composition of our blood is not remarkably dissimilar from our own blood. So in some ways, uh, the life of the planet is the same life that uh, is in our own veins. This was appreciated, has been appreciated very early on uh, by humans. Uh, so here's a, a little biblical quote for you from the, uh, or from the Torah, I guess. Uh, for the life of a creature is in the blood. Leviticus. The life of a, cre of the, a creature is in the blood. There's this understanding that there's something deeply vital. Uh, there's something deeply vital about the blood. So blood had this dual connotation. Uh, to the ancients. There's this idea that you, you see blood when you are wounded, when you bleed, when you're injured, thus representing death and mortality. But at the same time, you saw blood during menses, during uh, childbirth, thus representing the fulsomeness of life. Right? So there was this duality to, uh, to blood. And this was uh, symbolized in many ways. So for example, here, uh, the Greeks in the character of Medusa, the tragic character of Medusa. Uh, there was a duality to Medusa. So a, a symbol of life, this beautiful woman who is a, a, a demigod, right? Uh, but at the same time, uh, afflicted with the curse of, of snakes representing death. Half of her body, the right, the blood that coursed through the veins of the right half of her body, um, was was said to give life and to cure all uh, disease. Whereas the blood that flowed through the left side of her body uh, was thought to be caustic and poisonous and deadly. All right. Again, so this blood as life giving and uh, as a symbol of death as well. Uh, later. The, the medieval Christians uh, thought about the blood of the martyrs uh, as being uh, these relics that could cure disease and uh, bring good fortune and were honored as such. So I, I, I think I've said that I went to Notre Dame in the Basilica at Notre Dame. Uh, they have, like the whole Catholic thing is really far out. They have this amazing... Uh, room off in one of the narthexes in the basilica that's like full of this stuff. Teeny tiny little chips of bone from some guy named Ignatius in the 12th century or whatever. <clears throat> Interesting symbolism. Um, so blood, it was thought to be one uh, by the ancients, was thought to be one of the four humors. Uh, Aristotle, uh, I don't know how much you know about Aristotle's ontology, but he thought that there were four elements, right? Uh, earth, air, fire, and water. He organized uh, everything around that concept of, a, of a, the quartet, the two dipoles. Um, and then 
there were uh, Hippocrates had identified bodily humors that uh, became associated with these uh, these elements of Aristotle, and those bodily humors were first and foremost blood, uh, and then yellow bile, black bile, and phlegm. Yellow bile, black bile, and and phlegm. Yellow bile being represented in um, uh, pus, for example, or in um, uh, when someone vomits and their stomach is empty, like actual bile uh, is kind of yellowish. Uh, he thought that would be a yellow bile. Black bile being the Billy Rubin and Billy Verdon that give our feces the black color. Um, or in gangrene when your leg turns black. Uh, phlegm, I think we all know what mucus is. So those are the four bodily humors. And Galen um, tried to uh, push it forward a little bit and said that there were these temperamental categories associated with these bodily humors. Um, so uh, those temperamental categories were phlegmatic, representing a person who has an overabundance of the bodily humor of phlegm. If you're phlegmy, you have an unemotional and stolidly calm disposition. Uh, whereas you could be choleric, uh, represent so all, in all these ontologies, there were all these different uh, color patterns and elemental patterns that, that overlaid one another. So phlegmatic is white. Choleric uh, or, or uh, choleric is a person who's bad-tempered and irritable. So like a, a baby with colic uh, has an overabundance of this uh, black humor in their body. It's black bile humor. Uh, someone who's melancholic uh, has, is overly pensive or sad. Uh, and then, of course, is sanguine. A person who's sanguine is uh, a person who is optimistic or positive in the face of apparently bad uh, circumstances, right? And so uh, the word sanguine mean, literally means blood red. Um, it was one of the four temperamental categories. And amongst them, it is, is sort of like uh, the most appetitive of them, the, the one that is the most positive of, of the four uh, humors. Again, uh, sort of alluding to uh, the special role of blood in this, in this ontology. Uh, blood itself, as the fluid of life, was seen as being pleasing to the gods of so many cultures in the ancient world, both in the, in the new world and in the, and in the old. Um, so uh, here, for example, is a Mesoamerican uh, blood sacrifice to the gods. Uh, on the other hand, the, uh, the Judeo-Christian uh, ritual of sacrificing the blood of a lamb, uh, sacrificing the blood of the lamb, uh, which reached its pinnacle in the idea of Jesus, who was the Lamb of God, who, who actually transubstantiated wine and shared it with people as if you are drinking uh, of my life. When you drink this blood, you are taking it into yourself. So this deep idea of, of blood as being the source of life. All right. Um, I'm going to jump forward uh, a little bit. Uh, this right here, this um, classroom, it seems like it would be kind of fun to take a class in a classroom like that. Really tall. You know, this is what, like one, two, three, you know, maybe like a, a three-story tall tower with these narrow concentric rings looking down uh, upon what would be this demonstration table uh, that you would see right here. This was um, where this guy, uh, <clears throat> Girolamo Fabrizio Pendente. I struggle with that every year. Uh, this is where he first showed that veins have valves in them. This is where he first demonstrated 
uh, the centripetal flow of blood through the valves and the swelling at uh, the valve structures in the veins. All right. So uh, a little bit later after this, uh, the fascination with, with blood continues, and we have Van Leeuwenhoek, uh, who was uh, the first person to be able to take the, um, the microscope of Robert Hooke, the technology that Robert Hooke had been developing in terms of the, uh, the compound microscope, and was the first to train it onto the blood. And so this here is a depiction from Van Leeuwenhoek in his Arcana Natura in 1695. Uh, it's the first drawing of red blood cells that he was able to uh, visualize through his uh, rudimentary compound microscope. Um, about a, a little over 150 years later, uh, Lionel Beale, the English uh, physiologist, uh, drew this picture uh, in his Microscope in Medicine uh, that was published in 1863. Now the drawing at this point, the first one up here, that could be, I don't know what that is, it, it could be like snowballs with one snowball in the corner that you definitely don't want to get hit with. Uh, this actually is starting to look like blood, isn't it? It's starting to look like blood. So he didn't have any fixative agents. This blood that he was looking at uh, was probably fresh blood, but it was starting to coagulate. And as it coagulated, fibrin was getting produced. You're activating uh, leukocytes. Here, this looks like some kind of granulocyte. All right, and we have red blood cells. Maybe this is a platelet here. You're, you're beginning to actually see uh, what is sort of a recognizable depiction of, of blood. All right, so that's, that's all of history I'm going to walk you through today. Um, we'll talk about the basic function and composition of blood, uh, the structure of the red blood cell. I am not going to talk about hemoglobin now. I'll put that, I, That's in uh, the respiratory chapter. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about blood typing, uh, and then uh, maybe a little bit of uh, pathology. So first are uh, the body fluids and body compartments. So our body is predominantly water, right? And because of that, there are these various uh, compartments in the body where this water can be found. Um, about 40% of your body weight uh, is contained in intracellular fluid volume. That's inside the cells of our body. Uh, it's about 25 liters of water. It's quite a bit. It's about, you know, six gallons or so. The rest of it lives outside of cells, in, somewhere in the extracellular fluid. Um, and about 80% uh, of the extracellular fluid is in the interstitial fluid volume, so that's in the interstices between the cells. But about 20% of uh, the fluid in your body is actually a plasma volume in your blood. And this uh, itself represents about 4% um, of the total body weight. So most of the fluid in your body is not actually in your blood. Only 3 liters of the, what is that, 30, 40 liters? What does it do? Well, of course, it's going to transport uh, all sorts of dissolved uh, substances. It's the logistics medium for the body. This includes dissolved gases, uh, oxygen and carbon dioxide, various nutrients, hormones, metabolic wastes, and then the white blood cells. It acts as a buffer. It acts as a buffer. Uh, to the body by uh, controlling pH um, and because of all of the osmolites uh, that are in there, the buffering osmolites, and uh, it helps regulate uh, uh, the ions, the ionic concentration of the rest of the body. Uh, the blood has components in it 
that are responsible for hemostasis, so stopping uh, the loss of blood when you injure yourself. And um, it has white blood cells that are uh, the principal way that we avoid uh, infection. So it's uh, the primary defense against various pathogens. Lastly, importantly, it acts because of uh, water's high heat capacity, it acts as a huge heat sink to stabilize the body temperature. So if you are too hot, I've already said this, you can dilate the capillaries, send blood to the surface, you turn red and like shed heat, uh, whereas if you're cold, you can uh, contract the peripheral vasculature, sending more blood to the core and conserving heat. All right. So we can take blood and uh, fractionate it. You can take a sample of whole blood, you can stick it in a centrifuge and spin it real fast, and uh, the blood will separate between uh, the formed elements and the liquid component. All right, the liquid component being the, the plasma and the formed elements being the red blood cells and the white blood cells. Uh, across these formed elements, we're gonna have this white blood cell is also called the buffy coat, the buffy coat. So first, uh, let's, let's see what's inside uh, the liquid uh, com components of the blood. Um, it's the plasma. Most of it is um, water, of course. The solutes, there are some dissolved solutes that don't spin out. Uh, and the bulk of those, about 7% uh, of the plasma composition, are made up of a variety of proteins. Far and away, the most common of those proteins is albumin, all right, which is why Al so albumin is a globular protein. Uh, the high concentration of albumin in your blood is why albumin is used as an adjuvant in so many kinds of uh, vaccines. It helps to uh, stabilize the other components in the vaccine mixture and your body tolerates it. Um, so there... Uh, after the albumins, there's uh, a, a broader array of globulins. Uh, and these globulins that are there for other purposes than just osmotic uh, control, osmotic pressure control in the plasma, they are uh, often binding uh, various metal ions and helping to transport those. Uh, they can be hormones. There are a bunch of different protein hormones. Um, some globulin proteins can carry lipids uh, as part of their structure. Uh, the, the immunoglobulins form the antibodies uh, in our immune system. Um, a small amount of proteins in, in, the, in the plasma are made up of fibrinogen. So whenever you see a protein whose name uh, ends in the four letters O G E N, O G E N. That is a protein uh, that is. Um, it's been inactive. It's not an active. It's not fully active. It needs uh, some sort of activation, and typically that activation is a regulatory part of it is clipped off, and then uh, it becomes active. So fibrinogen can become fibrin when uh, some sort of peptidase will cleave, or protease will cleave off uh, the chunk of fibrin, fibrinogen that is keeping it behind. Then fibrin is uh, going to act as one of those fibers, like we saw in the picture of uh, uh, Beal, Beal's picture of the blood, it acts as uh, a bit of a net that um, stops bleeding. Um, and then uh, once we get past these like high numbers, well, we get into the regulatory proteins. Less than 1% of the proteins in the blood uh, are various enzymes, proenzymes, hormones. 
but the number of those proteins is huge. Their concentrations are extremely low, and I would say diagnostically, that's really the frontier. Uh, it's one of the frontiers in medicine right now, is being able to look at these extremely low concentrations of proteins and looking at variations in that uh, to uh, divine various diagnostic um, insights into the state of the body. Then there's going to be other solutes, right? So electrolytes, these are all your like anions and cations uh, that are in the, in the blood, uh, various organic nutrients like glucose, etc., cetera, uh, lipids, ATP, um, amino acids. And then there's going to be a bunch of organic wastes um, that are going somewhere in the body. Uh, maybe they're nitrogenous wastes, uh, such as urea or uric acid. Uh, maybe it's bilirubin that's going uh, to the liver. Okay. Then the formed elements. We talked about all this in lab today. There's the platelets, uh, and the white blood cells, and the red blood cells. I'm not going to belabor uh, those at all, but we talked about that in lab. All right. So all of this blood travels an enormous distance in the day. Your blood travels, so a statistic I, I read was that your, your blood travels as far as it would take to go from Portland, Maine to Portland, Oregon and back twice. Tw about 12,000 miles of uh, passageways are traversed in the body by your blood in, in a single day. Seems like a pretty serious amount of uh, logistics to make that happen. Uh, red blood cells. We talked about this in lab. Um, I'm just going to point out a few of uh, the additional features here. So red blood cells uh, don't have nuclei or mitochondria. Because of that, um, they're not able to repair any damage to themselves. If a red blood cell gets damaged, it just gets killed and recycled. Um, and also, because there are no mitochondria, the metabolism in a red blood cell is purely anaerobic. Purely anaerobic. Um, why do you think that is? Because we know the anaerobic metabolism only gives us two ATPs for every glucose, right? Whereas aerobic metabolism gives us an additional 34. So, so much more efficient, right? Wouldn't we use less glucose? Why do you think, I never asked the class this before, but why not? Why do you think uh, that a red blood cell is anaerobic? Yeah. Well, because they don't have mitochondria, but why don't they have mitochondria? They're not making proteins, but why not make a run? Instead of going through all the effort of like breaking down blood cells and building new ones when they, when they break, which takes a lot of extra energy, why don't we just have a red blood cell that can take care of itself? We're, at, we're spending more energy to have it be like this, right? Because there's other machinery out there that's going to have to like take stuff apart and put it back together. What do red blood cells do again? They transport oxygen. Their job is to transport oxygen. So why would this cell, whose job it is to transport, yes. Yeah. Yeah, right. It's just, I, there was some advertisement on, on YouTube. I was trying to watch a video, and, and it was like these two football players get on there, and they're talking about they started some cupcake company, right? And then, and then they, was that? Yeah, yeah. So I just saw it yesterday, and they're like, "Profits are great. Cupcakes are great as long as you don't eat your profits." That's kind of the point here, right? Their job is to transport oxygen, not to use oxygen. All right. So they're trying to maximally uh, ensure the delivery of of oxygen. 
so because of all that, it only lives it only lives for 120 days at most. Um, these red blood cells, the shape of the red blood cell uh, is such that uh, it has a, a couple of things. First of all, what, why do you think it, it has this shape? Before I tell you, what's what's the advantage of that? Huh? Do I, do I say? Does it say up there? Huh? Yeah. 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 Oh, hi. Yeah. I guess I don't. I, yeah. Right. All you have to do is read the slides. I guess to answer my questions. That's right. It's the high surface area to volume. Remember earlier I said uh, if you think about though that dynamic, the n and n minus one dimensional surface stuff that I was talking about, you can understand the shape that things take. Very high surface area to volume. Also, uh, because of their shape, they're able to form these things called rouleau stacks of cells that can fit through very teeny tiny uh, capillaries. These stacks, also known as rouleau. Oh, oh, I guess we will talk about hemoglobin a little bit. Um, not in depth. Uh, we'll, we'll get hemoglobin good and plenty later. But this is the, the structure of hemoglobin. Uh, basically, red blood cells are just packed with this stuff. That's, that's what they have, is a bunch of hemoglobin. Um, so what is hemoglobin? It is a globular protein that has, uh, the, in, the ter in the quaternary structure um, of the protein, it has four subunits, two alpha and two beta chains. So here are the two alpha, here are the two beta chains. Uh, and then in each of these subunits, we're going to have a little molecule called the heme. The heme. So the globulin and the heme come together to form the hemoglobin. It is this heme molecule that actually binds the iron. It actually coordinates uh, the iron. We'll see how that works uh, later next week. Turns out that in general, males have just a little bit more uh, hemoglobin in their whole blood uh, than females. And that's because females do the human race the service of... Um, of childbirth and menstruation is where they lose a lot of iron. So in general, women have a slightly lower, uh, are, they're more prone to anemia uh, because of that as well, which is a, a lack of, of red blood cells. All right, so you've heard of blood typing before. This is how it actually works. Um, on the surface, does anybody uh, want me to explain the word antigen? Does anybody... Is everybody comfortable with the word antigen? Okay. The, the word antigen uh, is simply a, a three-dimensional molecular fragment of something that has a unique shape. All right? It has a unique three-dimensional shape that an antibody in your blood is going to be able to recognize. All right? So um, a pathogen or a bug, a virus, bacteria, or something like that is going to have it's going to have its own special proteins on its surface. The structure of those proteins can act as antigens for antibodies. And in fact, all of the cells in your body all have antigens on them. All right, that are representative of the proteins that are being made in that cell. Okay. There's this thing that happens uh, right after you're born. Childbirth is so amazing. Every year I, I sort of wish I could have just a, one lecture about uh, everything that relates to child uh, development and birth. It's pretty fascinating. But one of the things that happens in that first week of life is called thymic deletion. So all of uh, the way the immune system works is... Uh, you don't have a gene that encodes every single antibody that your body makes. You don't have a, one gene, one antibody. It's not how it works. There is this 
random uh, combination of individual elements. So for example, a, a good, let me, let me explain it like this. In uh, many Asian languages, uh, for example, in Chinese uh, or in Japanese, you have a symbolic character for that word, don't you? And each word has its own symbolic character that's associated with it. Whereas in the English language, we have an alphabet of 26 characters, and we can combine them together and make uh, all these different words. So symbolically, you just need to store, if you had, if you were, uh, for example, a typesetter, uh, you would just need to have the alphabet uh, in English, whereas a typesetter in, in, uh, in Asian language would ha need to have a, like all of these different characters. It's like that in your genome, right? So to make an antibody, they combine just the individual elements and they do it randomly so it should have a really wide reach in terms of the kinds of antigens that it'll recognize. The problem is that uh, our bodies make antibodies against the self too. That's the weakness of this, right? Uh, you can make antibodies against the self. And uh, it would be like in English you could combine letters to make gibberish, right? You don't want those. You want to get rid of those. In like an Asian language, you, don't, you can't really do that. Like the symbol is the symbol. It means what it means, right? Um, so thymic deletion is the process whereby the thymus deletes or kills all of the T cells and B cells in the body that have been activated by uh, self-presenting antigens. So all of the T cells, all the lymphocytes that come against the, the, the self get killed off. All right? So you don't, we don't have them in our bodies. Uh, and then just leaving behind uh, cells that recognize foreign pathogens. Well, red blood cells are just like any other cell. They have antigens on their surface. But it turns out there's variation in the population. Some people have red blood cells that don't actually have any of this category of antigen that I'm, I'm going to talk about. And because of that, the antibodies that would recognize these proteins never get deleted. Never get deleted. Uh, this is why typo blood is universal donor. You can t stick typo blood in anybody's body, and it's not going to be killed off by any antibodies because they're they don't have those antigens. Type A blood has this A antigen on it, all right, and because of that, the type A antibodies in this person were killed off during thymic deletion uh, at birth, uh, but they still have the anti B antibodies. Vice versa for type B, they have the B antigen, the B antibodies have been deleted and left behind the type A antibodies. A person with type AB blood has both antigens and all the antibodies have been deleted for them. This is the universal acceptor. You can stick anybody's blood into this, but they can only donate to people with type AB blood. Because if you stick some, uh, for example, type B blood into a person with anti-B antibodies, this antibody is going to recognize that antigen and kill those cells, destroy those cells. All right? This is blood typing. Does this make sense? Is this like old news to most of you or new to some of you? All of you? I don't know. Um, I was going to talk about hemolytic, hemolytic uh, problems of the of the fetus, but I'm not going to. I'm actually not going to talk about this either. Let's skip that. Um, yes, sir. Do you give some A blood? If you donate A B blood to somebody today, what is the B antibody? If you donate this blood, is that what you're saying? To who? To anyone. Yeah, well, you could only. Oh, they're a receiver. They're a receiver. They're receivers. If, if you, they're the universal receiver. You can only donate that blood 
to another AB person. Would the antibodies from a type come with a blood type? Um, so if you were donating type B blood to a type AB person, uh, yes, uh, yes, that is true. But uh, these antibodies have a very short half-life, okay? Because there's no, you're not going to be donating active cells that are still pumping out a ton of this stuff, right? The, the, the antibodies have a very short half-life, and, and it's, it's not going to be, it's going to be insignificant. But in a, if you were to donate uh, this into this person, this person still has the, the cells that are making this antibody, and they're going to get activated and ramp up, and there's going to be a whole bunch more of them, and you're going to get a cascade going, right? Because they live in here. The cells that make this stuff don't live in this person. Yeah. There's an interesting story about hemolytic uh, problems with the infant that uh, we're going to, I'm going to skip. So... I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this, too. I, I guess I'll just point out this whole thing with fibrin. Fibrinogen can get activated to fibrin, and it forms this clot. You can see here all the fibrin fibers. This must have been something kind of similar to what Beale actually saw through his microscope uh, back when. All right. Oh, here it is, the pathologic, the, the hemolytic disease of the newborn. Okay, so... Uh, this is a real problem uh, that happens uh, for mothers. So uh, the A, B antigens, that's one type of antigen, blood antigen. There are others. There's the rhesus factor, uh, the Rh factor on blood. And, and people can either be uh, Rh positive or Rh negative. If you're Rh negative, it means you do not have uh, the, the rhesus antigen. And it's, an, it's named after rhesus monkeys in which this was first identified. But um, so it, it happens, the problem becomes when an Rh, mother neg an RH negative mother uh, has a child with an Rh positive father. And the child uh, inherits from the father the Rh positive gene. All right. So we have a baby that's Rh positive, mother's Rh negative, no problem. Except we have a rough delivery. We have a hard delivery here uh, where there's a hemorrhage. Maybe the placenta tears or something uh, at birth. And a little bit of the baby's blood gets into the mother's bloodstream. All right? There's like a tear. It's making you squeamish a bit. Yeah, it's pretty. It's not, it's not, uh, it's life, man. This is life. Life is real. So uh, the mother gets a little bit of the baby's blood uh, in her bloodstream at birth. And what happens is that sensitizes the mother. It sensitizes the mother. So now the mother makes a bunch of this uh, anti-RH antibody. All right? She's sensitized. Second pregnancy comes along. This mother's got all these antibodies, like pumping them out. And she, uh, they cross the, the placental barrier and start messing up that baby. All right, the second baby, the second baby who's also Rh positive. All right, so it has to have first baby Rh positive, mother Rh negative, second baby Rh positive, and the, there has to be hemorrhaging uh, during the first to sensitize the mother. All right, if that happens, it's a problem for that baby, the second baby, and it can be quite serious. Um, okay, I have some pictures. Maybe I cut them out. They're pretty graphic. But, uh, so here are some signs. You can, you can actually test uh, for hemolytic disease of the newborn uh, via this uh, Coombs test where you can, uh, it's, it's basically just a, a test tube test where you test for, you use an antibody uh, uh, that acts as a stain against activated antibodies that are on the antigen blood that is being taken. Uh, okay. So, oh, poor children. Um, 
So some signs are a uh, positive direct uh, Coombs test. Uh, if they have elevated bilirubin in their cord, uh, they can have hemolytic uh, anemia. Uh, they can get this very severe uh, form of prenatal heart failure uh, that will cause uh, fetal edema. So this baby looks bad. Uh, it, it, it can survive, and if it does survive, it will lead a normal life, right? This person, this, this child does not have a disease at all. It's just it had, uh, it got attacked by the mother's antibodies is what happened. So this, this child can lead a normal life. Um, it, this can be prevented. This can be prevented. Um, so you can give uh, unsensitized RH mother negative, uh, RH negative mothers uh, can be given RH uh, immunoglobin. Uh, also, it goes by this. Uh, named Rogam, uh, at 28 weeks to prevent the antibodies with reacting, from reacting with the Rh positive cells in the infant. So um, this is why blood typing is super important, right? When they used to make you do it when you got got married. I don't I, they still I don't think they still do, but uh, you used to have to get blood typed. You and your and your partner would have to get blood typed. Uh, one of the reasons is to help prevent uh, this this problem here. Very, very tragic. All right, on to the heart. Any questions about the blood? Yes, ma'am. So what's that? That may be something they can tell through amniocentesis. I'm not sure of that. Uh, but, um, I mean, the, the, the first two things are... Uh, you, well, you would do the, the Coombs test in the mother, right? So if the mother is Rh negative and the father is Rh positive and you had a baby, the first baby was Rh positive and you knew it was a hemorrhagic birth, then you would do the Coombs test on the mother to see if she got sensitized. If she got sensitized, then you give a Rogam. Second birth, just because. Does that make sense? You, uh, you know, you may, I don't know uh, how easy it is to tell the blood type of the second child uh, in utero, but you may be able to do it from an amniocentesis. I don't know, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anytime you have RH negative mother, RH positive baby that had a hemorrhage, all subsequent. And, 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 she, and she has a positive Coombs test. All subsequent births are going to have to go through this. Anyone else? Okay, on to the heart. Oh, my God, not more history. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Galen, I, I like making fun of that guy. He's, he's a pretty remarkable person, uh, but he's also... <laughs> Seems like such a, a funny, grouchy guy. Um, so this guy had, uh, he didn't quite have all the tubes connected up quite right. Uh, he, he believed that the blood was coming from the liver uh, into the right side of the heart. He got that correct. But then he thought that blood was coming, uh, seeping through little holes in the septum of the heart to the left side, maybe he saw a patent for Raymond Ovalli. Um, maybe that's where that idea came from. I don't know. Uh, but there was this a commonly held belief that there were these nearly invisible pores in the septum separating the two chambers. Um, this uh, concept persisted even in to Leonardo's depiction where the, the, the plumbing is, is certainly not uh, set up quite right in that picture. But we're going to talk about how it actually works. So we went through uh, the, the layers of the heart uh, earlier in lab, but I'm going to show you the fiber direction. Now the thing about uh, the, the muscle layers of the heart, the muscle layers, the fibers are in a sort of spiral pattern uh, that goes around the heart. So the heart doesn't just like contract like this. It sort of like sp it spirals down to really kind of wring as much blood out of the heart, uh, out of the chambers as it possibly can. 
so that, that's one thing. Another reason is as those fibers spiral around, uh, the, the layers that are spiraling under a, an upper layer are able to go across uh, there. You have like, you can have fiber crossing uh, at, at angles to one another, which reinforces the wall of, of the heart. Okay, so uh, cardiac muscle cells. In skeletal muscle, we had um, these uh, myoblast cells came together and, and formed these giant muscle cells, right, with tons of nuclei in them. So you have one very large cell uh, as much as 30 centimeters, right? Um, in cardiac muscle cells, it's not like that. Uh, they are individual cells. However, uh, each of these individual muscle cells is connected with, by, to adjacent cells via what's called these intercalated discs. Um, these intercalated discs are, are just basically uh, tacked together desmosomes that enable those cells to be really strong, long cables. So a myocardiocyte is like one continuous meshwork of muscle. Uh, that runs throughout that muscle wall. And secondly, there are a ton of gap junctions. So now you're understanding why I talked about desmosomes and gap junctions uh, at the beginning of the semester. Uh, gap junctions, what did I say about gap junctions? What are they? What were they? What was a desmosome? I said they were like spot welds, didn't I? Little like strong anchor points, giving the length of uh, several muscle cells or a long chain of them like a, a strength. Gap junctions weren't there for like tensile strength reasons, were they? No, they were there. They were like pores. They created pores uh, between the cells. So uh, cardiac muscle cells have... Um, It's, they're synstitial, meaning uh, the cytoplasm in each of the cells uh, is contiguous uh, between one another. That means myocardiocytes, like in the muscle cell wall of the heart, they kind of act as one single cell, one giant cell, right? They have the synstitium. They're like densely connected to one another. It's, uh, it's so that they can act in a, with a degree of harmony and uh, union that is not really seen in skeletal muscle cells. Uh, okay, so I showed this exact slide in lab. I guess I don't need to go through it again. Um, except to make the point that this excitation that happens is really rapid. Uh, it takes about one to four meters per second. That's how fast the uh, transmission moves. So it's just a few milliseconds for the signal to pass through the entirety of the heart. Okay. This is the cardiac cycle. Uh, give me, indulge me for a moment here. Yeah, okay. Those last two slides I combined into this slide. I, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I was redoing this rapidly this morning and apparently didn't delete those slides. So this is the same thing. Um, in the cardiac cycle, uh, let's, let's start it right here with a contraction. Uh, the heart's going to contract. It's going to give us a heart sound that we can hear, of course. Uh, and uh, this is what's also going to help us maintain our blood pressure. Uh, after the contraction, there's relaxation. And as the heart is relaxed, eventually we're going to get electrical stimulation, a spontaneous depolarization of the SA node. That's going to get distributed throughout the heart along the conduction system. Uh, that uh, distribution is going to trigger another cardiac contraction. And this distribution by the conduction system is also going to give us uh, the electrocardiogram, the ECG, the heart. Blips. 
So uh, this electrical stimulation that happens at the SA node, we can look at um, the transmembrane potential of the pacemaker cells. They're called pacemaker cells because they set the pace of the heart contraction. Um, unlike a normal muscle cell that uh, has its resting potential, right? It sits at the resting potential and just stays there until it gets triggered and has an action potential. Unlike that, these cells are always transiently leaking. They have this passive or spontaneous leakage across that membrane, which is going to bring them to threshold. They'll spontaneously, uh, they're going to spontaneously depolarize and then repolarize. Once they've repolarized, uh, they, they continue uh, to leak. So you might imagine that you could, you could cause this by having uh, a different expression patterns in terms of the leak channels and the FOF1 ATP, uh, not um, the, the, no, 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 the uh, wrong protein, the uh, sodium potassium ATPase, the pump, the sodium potassium pump. If you have differences in the relative uh, expression patterns of those two proteins, um, you're going to get something like this. Uh, okay, so we're going to explore what's happening here a little bit and the various aspects of this cardiac cycle. Uh, let's look at the conduction system first in, in a little bit of detail. We have the, uh, the, the cells in the SA node are going to reach uh, threshold. And the stimulus is going to spread out through the wall of the atrium uh, along uh, the internodal pathways to converge upon the AV node at the atrioventricular boundary. Uh, meanwhile, uh, that depolarization that has spread throughout uh, the, the wall of the atrium uh, begins to contract. Uh, that muscle uh, begins to contract the atrium, and it pushes blood uh, forward into the ventricles. Meanwhile, the AV node has depolarized and is sending a signal down the, uh, the bundle uh, and the bundle branches uh, to uh, the moderator band and the Purkinje fibers, uh, and then it spreads throughout the uh, wall of the ventricles causing uh, eventually a contraction in the ventricular wall. Does that make sense? All right. So all of this uh, gives, all this electrical activity is where we get uh, the electrocardiogram. Um, and what I have here is a picture of an ECG that had it, it, with all the parts labeled. We have a, a P wave, then there's this QRS complex, and then there's a T wave. So each of these things corresponds to specific things. This P wave is when we're having uh, the electricity, the electrical impulses flow through the atria walls. The QR complex is uh, when the ventricles, which are much more muscly, a much stronger uh, signal, uh, when these are beginning to depolarize, and then uh, this T wave at the end is simply the recovery wave uh, that happens. Okay. So let's look uh, in a little bit more detail at what's actually happening in, in an individual cardiac muscle cell. Um, we, we come here, we're getting the like spontaneous depolarization. We reach a uh, threshold and we get uh, rapid depolarization. Those sodium channels open up, sodium floods into the cell down its electrochemical gradient. Yeah, and uh, normally 
we would um, normally potassium would take over and we'd come back down right away, right? Um, but that's not what happens. It's not what happens in a cardiac muscle cell. Uh, instead, we hit this plateau because there's another player. Calcium uh, is part of the game as well here. And it uh, prevents repolarization. And so we get this long, uh, this long refractory period, this long plateau. Eventually, uh, the calcium stops and potassium takes over and we get a repolarization. So there's a third player here, calcium, which slows down the uh, dynamic uh, between the potassium and the sodium. All right? And so if you uh, compare, because of that, if you compare what happens in skeletal muscle with the, the rapid uh, contraction and the rapid depolarization and repolarization and uh, the formation of tension here, uh, when you look at, when you compare that to cardiac muscle with the long action potential and the contraction wave that happens in, in cardiac muscle, most of the contraction force, the actual tension that's being generated in a skeletal muscle exists outside of the refractory period, doesn't it? All right, it exists outside of the refractory period. Because of that, that is, that's how we're able to get wave summation in skeletal muscles, right? Because since you're outside of the refractory period, you can have another action potential and pump that tension up higher and higher and higher. You don't want that. Because remember, you eventually can get to tetanus, right? Where the muscle is just like constantly contracted until it runs out of ATP. You don't want that in your heart. You definitely do not. The heart is not about like lifting some enormous weight and just holding it and holding it, right? Uh, it's about like having beats, making sure you're keeping on beating time after time after time. So the heart uh, is able to come to actual relaxation before it's being asked to contract again. It prevents wave summation. It prevents uh, that additive... Uh, tension from contraction uh, uh, from happening in the heart muscle cell. Does this make sense? Yeah. Cool. Okay. So now let's, that's the electrical component of it. Let's look at the, the physical component. Uh, where should I start? I guess probably start where it says start. Um, at the beginning in this cycle here, uh, we're going to have atrial systole. So systole means contraction. Diastole means when something's not contracting or it's when it's relaxing. So uh, atrial systole begins and that uh, the atria contract and push blood into the ventricles. All right? We're in atrial systole now. And this is ventricular diastole. The ventricles are relaxed. They're just going to uh, get filled with blood. The atrium pushes much blood into them as possible. And then eventually, uh, atrial systole will end and ventricular systole will begin. When that happens, those ventricles are going to contract and shove as much blood as they can out through the semilunar valves. All right? And the AV valves will close so we don't have any regurgitation of blood back into the atrium. The blood will shoot out through uh, the ventricles. Um, eventually, uh, we'll, we'll enter ventricular diastole, so we'll be in atrial and ventricular diastole for uh, all of this period here. And it puts times on all of this stuff, uh, particularly the ventricular diastole and atrial diastole. That, those times are completely irrelevant because uh, your heart rate changes, and when your heart rate changes, that number so don't worry. Um, but uh, during all this diastole, we have what's called passive film. So the heart, uh, the, the blood pressure that's in your veins, so there is venous blood pressure, 
that blood pressure is pushing into the relaxed atrium and into the relaxed ventricles and is filling both of those passively during diastole. Um, so one way to increase cardiac output, which is uh, the rate at which your heart, and we'll talk about that later, but the rate at which your heart is blowing blood out, uh, is to increase venous return. So if you can increase the amount of blood that's returning to the heart, that venous blood pressure, that actually increases cardiac output. All right? Venous return is one way uh, to increase how much, how efficient your heart is. Okay. So this slide is uh, probably one of the most useful slides in the, in the talk because it puts it all together in one spot. All these things I've been talking about uh, gets put together in one spot. In the top is the ECG, um, and in the bottom, uh, in the middle frame, let's go to the middle frame, uh, we're, we're looking at pressure, uh, blood pressure, in a number of compartments uh, with time. So here's the aorta in black. Here's the left atrium and the left ventricle. Left atrium in, in blue, left atrium in red. We're just we're ignoring the right for now. This is just the left side of the body. Um, so the left atrium is contracting here. The pressure goes up, and it's pushing blood. So we're, we're lined up with the P wave, which was atrial contraction. Uh, that left atrium is pushing blood into the left ventricle, whose pressure is also going up. And then we get to the QR complex, where the left ventricle is going to begin to contract. All right? The atrium goes into systole, and the ventricle goes into diastole. It starts contracting, and it shoots that blood pressure up inside the heart. The blood pressure begins to shoot up until the pressure is equal to the pressure in the aorta that it's fighting against. As soon as the pressure in the uh, ventricle exceeds that of the aorta, it's going to push open the doors into the aorta, and we're going to get blood shooting into the aorta. The aortic pressure matches that until the aortic valves close, they snap closed, and the aortic pressure is pretty high here. Uh, so this would be uh, systolic pressure, and that would be diastolic pressure. When you're taking your blood pressure, this would be, so this person here has like 110 over maybe 785 or something like that would be their blood pressure, okay? And then the, uh, we go into, uh, into diastol right at this point, and the blood pressure drops and we start it again, okay? So I'm, I'm all of this, I'm trying to get you to what's called cardiodynamics or understanding how to affect cardiac output, all right? For like the few athletes out there, this is one of the, this is like the good stuff. This is how to like increase uh, your VO2 max and a number of other uh, things that are related to performance. To do that, we gotta talk about the concepts of preload and afterload. So first, the, the afterload is the pressure against which the heart has to work to eject blood during systole. That uh, afterload pressure is essentially your diastolic pressure, right? It's the pressure that the, that the heart has to get to uh, to eject blood. So if you have high blood pressure, you, your diastolic blood pressure is going to be higher, and you're going to be able to eject less blood. You're not going to be able to eject as much blood because you're working against more afterload to push blood out of the heart. Uh, preload is the end volumetric pressure uh, that stretches the ventricle. So this is how, what's the pressure of that venous blood that's coming back from the venous return? If that is high, that's a good thing because you're getting more, uh, you're getting more blood on, on deck uh, to eject, All right? Uh, and it's bringing this baseline closer to the aortic pressure. All right, so that you don't have to, not as much of a contraction is dedicated towards reaching aortic pressure. Does that make sense? Who's lost? Who's found? Is anyone asleep? No? Okay, let's go to the volume. Let's go to the volume parts. Um, 
So this is just the left ventricle volume, all right? And this is the period of passive filling right here, passive filling when both atrium and ventricle are in uh, diastole, passive filling. This is active filling when the atrium is contracting. This is when diastole uh, ends for the ventricle and, and, uh, and systole begins. So we call this the end diastolic volume. That's an important number because that's the amount of blood that's actually in the heart, that the heart has available to eject, right? It's the amount of blood that the, the heart has available to eject. So then it goes through systole, and at the end of systole, we reach end systolic volume. This is the other important number because this is how much blood is left in the heart. There's some blood. You can't get all of it out, right? But the more of it you get out, so the lower end systolic volume is, the more, heart, the more blood your heart was able to put into the system. We're trying to make our heart efficient here, right? So all of these different parameters, I'm going to go through them in a, in a diagram and talk about how each of them is going to affect the efficiency of the heart in a bit. Uh, okay, you guys, everybody clear on, on this diagram? Uh, you, can, you can map the heart sounds onto this as well. So the lub dub that we hear, uh, that lub dub sound, is actually uh, the summing inner valves opening and closing. That's what that is. It's the lub dub. Uh, but there are other sounds as well that you can hear in the heart. Uh, you can hear the left atrium uh, contracting, um, et cetera, et cetera. The AV valves uh, opening. Okay, so cardiodynamics. Let's go through these terms that I gave you. I've, I've given you a lot of these terms already, so, but let's, let's think about them. There's the end diastolic volume, right? That's how much blood is in the heart at the end of its relaxation period. It's how much blood is there, what, what the heart has to work with, like how much blood is gonna be ejected, that we have to eject. There's the end systolic volume, that uh, is how much blood is left after the contraction. So the difference of those two is what we call the stroke volume. That's how much for each stroke of the heart, each like contraction of the heart, that's how much blood was, was ejection, ejected, all right? So the units of that are milliliters per beat. How many milliliters for each beat of the heart uh, is your stroke volume? It's the difference between the end diastolic and the end systolic volumes. Then there's the ejection fraction. The ejection fraction is uh, it's the percent of end diastolic volume uh, represented by the stroke volume. All right. So uh, say that you know your end diastolic end uh, systolic volume is maybe 50 milliliters. Um, Oh, no, I'm sorry. Your, uh, your end diastolic volume is maybe 130 milliliters, but uh, your stroke volume was 80 milliliters. What percentage of that uh, of that blood that was in the heart during end diastolic volume was ejected? All right, that's that's the stroke volume. So, stroke ejection fraction I, is a measure of the efficiency of the heart. The higher your ejection fraction is, the more that heart was being able to uh, push, more of the blood that it had in it was getting pushed out of it. That's what they call, that's why they talk about ejection fraction. It's a measure of the, the efficiency of the heart. Okay, so then an important concept here is, is cardiac output. And I'm going to spend uh, some time here talking about how the heart uh, maximizes cardiac output. So cardiac output is just the volume of blood that the heart is pumping out uh, of the left ventricle in a minute. And the way we determine that is we, uh, we just take the product of the stroke volume, which is milliliters per beat, and multiply that times the heart rate, which is beats per minute. So beats per minute times milliliters per beat Beats cancel, it's milliliters per minute. 
All right, does that make sense to everybody? Basic multiplication. The cardiac output. Okay, so uh, this is, I'm gonna have like three or maybe four different diagrams uh, that look kind of like this that are talking about how to maximize or, or affect cardiac output. And this is the simplest of them. Um, so we know that cardiac output is the product of the heart rate and the stroke volume. So ways to affect the cardiac output are either affect the heart rate or affect the stroke volume. And there are different things affect uh, each of those. So in terms of the heart rate, uh, you can have hormones or uh, the nervous system, right? So either the endocrine or the nervous system are going to affect uh, the heart rate. And the nervous system by way of autonomic innervation. I'll talk about that first. And then in terms of stroke volume, we know that stroke volume is just the difference of the end diastolic volume, which is how much heart blood the heart had uh, at, at the beginning, and end systolic volume, which is how much blood was left after contracting. Uh, so ways that we can affect those two things, the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume, will affect stroke volume and thus cardiac output. Uh, let's let's work on the heart rate first. So I said I wasn't going to give you any autonomic nervous system, and that's mostly true, but I, I kind of need to talk about some of it here to talk about the heart. Um, we have the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic, right? The, flight or, the fight or flight and the rest and digest. Well, it turns out that every time your heart is beating, uh, it's subject to either of those things, right? Um, the sympathetic nervous system, uh, both of the, so the parasympathetic and the, and the sympathetic nervous system, both have uh, centers in the brainstem, specifically the medulla oblongata, uh, which I will, as a tangent, say is the oldest part of the brain and thus uh, signifies what, uh, how ancient this system of control over the heart and how important it is to life, right? This is like way before humans were humans. Um, this, we're going way back into the origin of chordates when things had hearts and, and the first hearts and brains. Uh, this, this system uh, began. So those centers are the cardio acceleratory center and the cardio inhibitory center uh, right next to each other in the, in the brainstem of the medulla. Um, the Let's do the cardio acceleratory uh, system first. The way this works is it's through accelerate, fight or flight, it's going uh, via the sympathetic nerves. It's gonna come down the spinal cord and out uh, into this other chain, uh, the sympathetic chain ganglia. So there's these, these uh, sympathetic ganglia that are outside of the spinal cord running along the back wall of the body. Uh, that's the sympathetic nervous system. So we have a synapse there, and then it sends uh, branches uh, off the sympathetic chain ganglia along this cardiac nerve to the heart. And uh, it's going to accelerate the heart rate. I'll show you how in the next slide, don't worry. Um, on the other hand, we have one of the 12 cranial nerves. In fact, uh, number 10. I talked about the vagus nerve uh, a little bit. I said vagus is like vagrant, it's the wandering nerve. It goes all over the body, does all sorts of things, little branches of the vagus nerve. One of them, one of the branches of the vagus nerve, uh, comes down and uh, synapses on the heart with parasympathetic, um, parasympathetic synapses. So, uh, I don't know, I, I kind of skipped over the the uh, types of receptors a little bit yesterday or the day before, whatever day that was. Uh, but these are going to be cholinergic and these are going to be um, gabinergic. This is how it works. This is how it actually works. Um, all that happens is 
when a parasympathetic, uh, when there's parasympathetic involvement in the heart, it is going to slow the heart rate. It's called bradycardia. Bradycardia just means a slow heart rate. Uh, and the way it does that is the, when it synapses on those cells, on those pacemaker cells, uh, it is the kind of synapse is going to be one that hyperpolarizes that cell. So it pushes the potential lower than it normally would. Here's normal, right? Threshold is there at about whatever it is, minus, looks like minus 35. Uh, and here's normal. It pushes, it hyperpolarizes that cell when you're having parasympathetic input. So it just takes longer to passively depolarize up to the threshold. That's all. And since it takes longer, it spreads the heartbeats out. And it, it spreads the action potentials out uh, in those pacemaker cells. The exact opposite happens here. So this is baseline resting potential. Uh, but it has a sympathetic synapse on it, which is going to uh, depolarize uh, the membrane just a little bit. And it pushes this baseline closer to the threshold, so it takes less time to get up to threshold. Thus, it kind of squeezes the action potentials together, so we speed the heart up. All right? That's called tachycardia like a, a, a tachometer, T-A-C-H-Y-ometer, on your car. If anybody's anybody you drive a stick shift, if you've ever driven a stick shift, there's always that line, the tachometer, that shows you the RPM of your engine, the speed at which your engine is, is revving. So tachometer is just a speeding heart rate. Or uh, tachycardia is a speeding heart rate. Uh, any other thing? Questions on this? Okay. So this is some new stuff I put in here because I think it's really interesting. Um, it turns out that you can measure ambient uh, or baseline sympathetic. It's called vagal tonus. You can, you can measure your vagal tonus, which is uh, the ambient balance between your sympathetic nervous system and your parasympathetic nervous system by looking at something called heart rate variability. And uh, heart rate variability is simply a variation in the time intervals between uh, heartbeats. So this is a, this is a lab I, I like, I'm going to try to do this lab at the end of the month in our metabolic analysis lab that we're going to do in the gym. I'm going to go to the gym one day and do some stuff in the gym. Um, and I bought a bunch of equipment for this. I haven't written the lab yet. It's like living up here. If I can get it out of up here, uh, then we'll do it. But uh, you need to know this concept to be able to do the lab. It should be pretty interesting. Um, so uh, when, from one heartbeat to the next, that time interval can actually vary um, a little bit. And um, Particularly since exhalation is, uh, so it's auto automatic as well, right? But it can, it can uh, it's exhalation is driven by uh, parasympathetic efflux and inhalation is driven by sympathetic efflux, right? So uh, as you exhale, uh, you're getting your increasing a uh, vagal tone, the, the parasympathetic vagal output, and uh, oppositely on uh, inhalation. So there's there should be in a in a in a, a typical person uh, some heart rate variability. So this is this this is manifest in like slight variations. And we're talking really small here, just milliseconds, right? So uh, you know, 845 milliseconds versus 754 milliseconds. That's only nine BPM variation uh, that can happen. So uh, let's, let's keep going with this. Um, if you have high heart rate variability, this is indicative of having 
relative balance between the parasympathetic nervous system and the sympathetic nervous system. Uh, this it indicates that you probably have long, um, breathing patterns of longer breath, uh, slower breathing. Uh, physiologically, uh, it, it tends to correlate with resistance uh, to stress, of like a better uh, output, uh, uh, outlook on life, better emotional uh, base. And if you look at, so this is heart rate. This is not, this is not the ECG. This is looking at the time interval between the RR peaks. Uh, so looking at your heart rate. Does anybody ever have one of those heart rate monitors on their watch or something? And you're like, yeah, right. When you run, you ever look at that thing, that rhythmogram? Uh, it, it looks like this, right? And it uh, can, so this is someone with fairly high heart rate variability. It's pretty good. If you have low heart rate variability, that means that you have a sort of overactive sympathetic nervous system. And a lot of people are there in our world, right? It's a really adrenaline-driven uh, society. A lot of people really sympathetically in the fight-or-flight mode all the time. And if that's the case, it tends to suppress heart rate variability. So the heart is like very regular, like a clock, like a metronome. It doesn't change. The changes in heart rate uh, uh, intervals are much slower, are much slower. So we get this slower uh, variation in heart rate variability. That tends to correlate with, uh, it's comorbid, or it's, it correlates with um, these various uh, uh, indicators of mortality, like heart, heart disease and cancer, et cetera, et cetera, uh, and is, um, Correlated with anxiety, depression, uh, people with PTSD show low heart rate variability. Um, so uh, that's these are rhythmograms. I just said, uh, I just showed some pictures of them. It's heart rate versus time. Well, uh, I'm showing these two because these are uh, some rhythmograms I got. I found from this dude here who's on on, on the web. He built this little gizmo, which has a, a glowing orb, and uh, the color of the orb is, it was a, he was trying to make a biofeedback machine where the color of the orb is, res, is uh, responsive to his heart rate variability, and so uh, he was trying to use it as a meditation tool or something. And when, uh, when his heart rate variability went up, it became blue, and when it went down, it turned red or whatever. It's like this visual thing you can cue into. So anyways, uh, here, here are a couple rhythmograms that he had. And I'm going to use those in a minute. But um, I want to talk about how to analyze it. So you have your heart rate rhythmogram, and uh, you can do what's called a Fourier transform on it. It's a mathematical procedure that you don't need to worry about. But essentially, you're pulling out the different, fre you're separating the different frequencies of oscillation in that signal. Just like in a radio signal, when you hear a song, there are high frequencies and low frequencies and all kinds of different frequencies. If you did a Fourier transform on music, you would be able to separate each of those frequencies out and just listen to this frequency or that frequency or the lows or the highs. Right. That's basically what an EQ is doing anyways. Or like when you see the music EQ with all the, the different frequencies going up and down. Uh, and so then you can analyze the intensity, of the amplitude of these different frequencies at these, uh, at these wavelengths. Uh, if you have high intensity, slow oscillations, these are driven by the sympathetic nervous system and the parasympathetic nervous system. Uh, drives these uh, fast oscillations. Okay, so for example, web surfing is going to have stronger low frequency and weaker high frequency, and on the other hand, uh, an activity like meditation is going to have a high frequency uh, or high intensity high frequency and low intensity low frequency. And here are this guy's uh, rhythmogram. So let's look at them. Oops. 
So if we look at these two patterns, here is the here are these high uh, high amplitude low frequency oscillations in the in this right here indicating sympathetic nervous system. Whereas here we have high amplitude uh, high frequency ones indicating uh, parasympathetic uh, preponderance of parasympathetic signal. This doesn't mean that the others aren't there. Right here, there still are high amplitude oscillations in the signal. They're just low amplitude. They're not very loud. They're not very strong, if you want to think of it that way. You guys following this? Who's lost at all? Anyone? No one? And it doesn't mean that there's not sympathetic tone here, too. It's just the amplitude of them, the like how strong these oscillations are is less. It's, it's, they're sort of quieter frequencies. Does that make sense? So you can look at the power spectrum for this. Where you look, So this is going to be <coughs> frequency. This is low frequency. This is high frequency. And this is just intensity. Like ampli you can think of it as like the strength of the amplitude at that frequency. Uh, this would be a sympathetic, a person with sympathetic modulation, and here's someone with a parasympathetic modulation. So, like, there's a pretty high uh, intensity, high frequency bump uh, in that guy's uh, spectrum uh, when he was meditating versus when he was surfing the web on Instagram or whatever. Uh, okay, so I know I went off the road a little bit with that, but. It's pretty interesting. I thought maybe you guys would find it interesting. Let's get back to cardiac output. So, um, again, this is that same uh, summary slide that I put of the factors that affect heart rate and stroke volume, which ultimately affect cardiac output. This is the same, uh, but now we're, we're switching from heart rate. I talked about heart rate. Uh, and the parasympathetic and sympathetic effects on that. We're going to switch to the other side of that uh, and get to stroke volume. So this was the chart I put up, and, and now we're going to talk about stroke volume. And these are the things that can affect stroke volume. Um, so this looks like, before I get into this, this looks like a super complicated chart, and I know many of you are probably despairing. The thing about it is... you. I don't have this whole thing memorized. I have the underlying principle memorized, and then I can extrapolate the whole chart if I had to, right? Uh, so understand the basic principle of what stroke volume is and how you get it. To increase stroke volume, you want to either increase end diastolic volume or decrease end systolic volume. If you get that into your head, then all this other stuff is going to make sense, as long as you also learn what these definitions are. So filling time is just how long uh, the heart is able to uh, fill, passively fill the ventricles, the atria and the ventricles. The venous return is related to that, and it's, it's the rate of blood flow back into the heart that's going to um, that's going to happen during the ventricular diastole. And then the two other terms we talked about er earlier, I've already, already given you the definitions of, are preload and afterload. So preload is, the, is that venous return pressure, that pressure that's filling the heart and stretching uh, the right or left ventricle. And afterload is just the, the blood pressure that the heart has to work against uh, in, the, in the aorta. Um, or in the pulmonary trunk, if you're talking about the other side of the heart. So uh, let me let me let's walk through this. Ways to affect end diastolic volume: that how much heart uh, blood is in the heart before contractions. So the way to affect that is preload. How much preload do we have? Are we pushing into the heart? And to do that, we can either increase uh, to 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 uh, increase end diastolic volume, we can increase the filling time. Just wait longer 
for the for the uh, heart to fit the the chambers to fill. That would be correlated with a lower heart rate, wouldn't it? So the slower your heart rate is, the more time you're giving your heart to fill. Uh, and then there's venous return. How much blood is coming back from the the uh, the, the venous uh, portion of your heart? So that's going to positively correlate, directly correlate. So increased venous return equals increased end diastolic volume. That's it. So on the other hand, there's end systolic volume. So end systolic volume is inversely correlated with stroke volume, whereas end diastolic volume is directly correlated. Increased end diastolic volume equals increased stroke volume. End systolic volume is inversely correlated. So if you, this means if you leave a lot of blood in the heart after contraction, that's going to reduce your stroke volume. Right? That's blood that didn't get ejected. Uh, so uh, let's look at how we can affect end systolic volume. Um, we can either uh, affect it by uh, sympathetic or parasympathetic. Well, I guess before I go way up there. Uh, we, can, we can affect end systolic volume by the contractility of the muscle cells. How strongly did those muscle cells contract? All right. Uh, and so increased contractility is a decreased end systolic volume, meaning that you, we pumped more blood out, right? There's a higher stroke volume. If you have increased contractility, there's a higher stroke volume. Uh, and this gets affected by sympathetic, parasympathetic uh, nervous system, and then various hormones like uh, super, the uh, epinephrine. On the other hand, uh, afterload also affects end systolic volume. So afterload is just that aortic pressure that we're working with. So increased aortic pressure means increased end systolic volume. It means we had to work harder against the blood that was in the aorta already, and we're going to have ejected less blood. All right? So all of that, is, it, it, there are logical connections between each of them. Uh, don't worry about like, when, I'm think, when you're thinking about this, don't like zoom in right here or zoom in right there. Uh, you can look at that, but uh, have the concept of what, stroke, what cardiac output is, what stroke volume is, and then, uh, so then you'll be able to think about the things that are going to affect that. Okay? Uh, this is the same chart, but I'm just putting the two sides together. So heart rate and stroke volume are all on the same are all in the same picture. I won't go through it again because I just went through the whole thing. But I, I put this on one slide for you, uh, so you can see all of it together. Um, all right, I, I don't want to get too tied up because I want to talk a little bit about heart disease and heart attacks this weekend. Talk about the fun stuff. Uh, I would guess that everyone in this room has had somebody in their family who's had some kind of uh, problem with heart disease, uh, or at least a, a large proportion of you. Um, my dad's entire side of the family has dealt with it. So, uh, yeah, I'm trying, I'm trying to not be part of that. Um, it's just this. Atherosclerosis, hardening of the arteries, a deposition of fatty plaque, mast cells that become foam cells and take up uh, the lipids that are in your blood and then uh, go get involved in a inflammatory cascade and get deposited on the wall. So you saw a picture of a healthy artery today and like, all oh, this looks pretty good, right? This all looks good. This does not. None of that looks good. It should look like this all the way around. It should look like that all the way around. But uh, we've had fatty plaque getting deposited in the wall of the blood vessel. And with time, it gets completely occluded, meaning blocked. And the muscle wall of the heart uh, gets starved for oxygen and dies. And we have a myocardial infarction. Uh, meaning just that the heart muscle can't function any longer. 
So I think these are supposed to be yeah, media not found. Come on. Duh. Duh. Okay, well, I had an, uh, an angiogram of uh, hearts. Well, we'll just skip it. Let's keep going. Come on, computer. I had I had an angiogram where you could see the occlusion. So if this is your problem, you often develop what's called angina or angina, uh, angina pectoris. Um, and this is when you get like a temporary ischemia. Ischemia is when tissue is deprived of blood or oxygen. It's, it's tissue that's been deprived of oxygen. It's when you have uh, ischemia. Uh, you get a temporary ischemia when the workload, you start asking the heart to do more work than the coronary vessels have the capacity to deliver oxygen to do. All right. So the tissue goes hypoxic. The heart was not designed to be an anaerobic muscle. It was designed to be a fully aerobic muscle, okay? So if you are increasing demand on the heart because you have uh, atherosclerosis and you go for a jog, uh, you can develop this angina pectoris. So it's like the precursor to a heart attack. It's not a heart attack, but uh, it's the precursor to it. And you get these pain, this pain bands that run referred pain uh, that you see in the pattern right here. So anybody who's talking about who has pain in any of these regions, uh, it's angina. So smoking, if you have high blood pressure, if you have a really, uh, uh, when I say high fat diet, I eat a ton of avocados. Uh, I'm talking about like trans fats uh, when you have like a, the bad fats. Uh, if you're super stressed out, super stressed out, folks, don't do it. Don't do it. Be in the medical profession, but just be totally at peace if you can. If you, uh, if, if you sit on your butt too much, if you don't move around, if you don't move around, shake it, uh, then that's also uh, correlated with uh, angina. So... Here, this is, this is real, man. 25% uh, of people with myocardial infarction, that's a heart attack, right? Uh, they die before anybody can get to them, right? You have a heart attack, heart stops, is like, I'm out, done. Uh, heart stops, somebody's got to get there. 25% of them, uh, people who have a uh, myocardial infarction die first. Um, so 65% of myocardial uh, infarction deaths among those under the age of 50 occur within an hour after the initial infarction. This means, if, particularly if you're under 50, get your butt to the hospital as quick as you can because you got uh, it, chances are you're going to lose it if you can't get there uh, within an hour. Um, yeah, let's see. So this statistic uh, is, that's about two years old now. Uh, it's closer to three quarters of a million people now. Uh, die of heart disease in the U.S. every year. That's a pretty large number. That's 25% of all deaths in the United States. One out of every four people who kicks it uh, is because of heart disease in the United States. Uh, this costs the United States uh, in 20. 2010, uh, it's actually about half of a trillion dollars nowadays. Half a trillion dollars. Our government has closed over $5.7 billion worth of bullshit bricks. Half a trillion dollars because of heart disease. You want to talk about an emergency? That's an emergency. That's a national emergency, folks. It's real. And, uh, you know... Part of it is the Paula Deen diet right down here. This is not, these are not counties that voted for Trump. This is people who have heart disease right here in, in the South. High trans fat diets, all right? Uh, but, whew, look at where else. 
Look at where else has a high incidence of it. Uh, Maine has the highest incidence of heart disease in New England. I think, I think uh, we know that, though. There's a lot of people in Maine that don't uh, take very good care of their heart. Okay? Don't make the right kind of choices in terms of food, whatever they're, they're eating, their activity level. A lot of smokers in Maine. God. Uh, so here are just some like tools. Uh, you know, you have a heart attack, the heart stops working, you put a defibrillator on it, send a little electrical current, jump start. Uh, the heart, it's like jumper cables for the, for your ticker. Um, I don't know, I just have a couple minutes here. Uh, let's, let's, let me flash through these. This is, these are all G whiz stuff. You're not going to get tested on any of this. Heart lung machine. Let's see if there's anything interesting in here. Just a bunch of pictures. <laughs> um, okay, that's it. Whatever. Just a bunch of stuff. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir.